All right. Well, thanks for joining us for our second complimentary gathering. I'm Erin Burt, the attorney and mediator here at the firm. I'm joined by Tyler. Do you want to introduce yourself? I'm Tyler Burt. I'm the paralegal and office manager. And Karen? Hi, I'm Karen Hansel. I'm the um, administrative assistant to the firm. Great. Well, you know, we were going to open up maybe, I don't know, talk about current events for a little bit. Um, and then if there are any questions that we want to get to today that may have been posed by either clients or potential clients, we can get to that. Sounds good. Sounds good. Great. All right. So I don't know, has there been anything in the news or any current topics that you think um, are, are interesting or divorce related that, you know, people might want to know a little bit more about? I do. So in the news recently, uh, obviously, Lisa Marie Presley had passed. And, you know, I just saw a headline the other day that her, you know, husband, ex-husband is getting custody, you know, of the kids, you know, uh, since her passing. So, I mean, that's, uh, you know, kind of a big deal, I guess, in that in that area. Yeah, definitely. I mean, sad situation all around, right? I, I mean, it, it. the kids are going through a lot right now, but there seems to be also just a lot of questions out there about what happens to the kids, you know, in circumstances where maybe you're involved. I think the articles out there were saying that Lisa Marie and her, her ex were involved in litigation at the time of her death, or at least were discussing or negotiating custody issues. You know, what happens when somebody passes away um, while there's either a pending case or, or just child related issues, right? Yeah. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. So, I, and, and I think some people were kind of surprised like, you know, who's going to get the kids? Is, is Priscilla Presley going to get the kids, the grandma? Are there, you know, I think there were a couple other people that were perhaps, you know, coming out in the media saying that they were going to you know, try to have the children live with them. I don't know, maybe I got that wrong. But. I think it was like um, Lisa Marie's, um, for, uh, one of her, the ex-husband um, that wouldn't, that li lived with her at the time that they were going to pass the father to her other two kids. So, so like a step-parent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Step yeah. Yeah. So I think, you know, yeah. somebody in my family asked me about it when Lisa Marie passed away, you know, what happens to the kids and, and, my initial reaction was, well, they're going to go to their biological father. I mean, the case is pending. It wasn't determined there, to the best of my knowledge, weren't any restrictions that were ordered by a court. Um, and so, you know, typically when somebody passes away during a divorce or a custody proceeding, the, you file a death certificate or a notice of death with the court and the case is dismissed. It's no yeah. longer pending yeah. at that time. And so, and if there's a capable uh, parent um, that the children, essentially the custody gets transferred to that parent, but it's as if there's no custody case pending any longer. So I assumed, and, and, and you know, my background led me to quickly say that the children would just go to their dad. At least that's what would happen here in Illinois, you know, Right. But then, you <laughs> but know, California might be that. different, right? I mean, California may allow grandparents' rights, may allow step-parents' rights. Um, you know, so anybody can file a claim. Anybody could file a pleading to um, have either custody or guardianship of the children. But then it's really going to come down to California law as to who has rights to the children, but I would say first and foremost, it 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 just defaults to the father. Yeah. yeah. And, and they could bring those matters at any time. Like if they don't, like if say one of the step parent or the grandparent would not feel they're getting enough time or feel that they're being left out of things on purpose, then they could always, until, until they're an adult, right? Until that happens. They could probably yeah, pretty do much until they're up. pretty much until they're 18. You know, anybody can file when it's child related. Anybody that has a concern, an interest, or relationship in the children, okay. they can petition the court for access to the children. But then it's up to case law, statute, um, what's allowable um, for certain rights. Again, it's guardianship rights, it's grandparents' rights, it's custodial rights. Um, 
but I would suspect absent any serious endangerment or any other restrictions or any other issues on the father's behalf, it's going to be a, it's going to be an uphill battle to, to try to interject in that relationship. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. You know, and then the other case, I think a lot of people are, are looking at is just finances. What does that mean? These young children, I think are going to inherit, um, a very large estate and, um, you know, what happens with that? Um, most likely it stays with the children. Clearly the father has some influence over the children, but, um, it doesn't necessarily mean that the father is going to have any rights to that estate because he was already financially divorced. He was already divorced from Lisa Marie. So she didn't yeah. leave him anything right. in her estate planning. He, he really doesn't have yeah. any marital rights to the estate that she left behind. So yeah, current it's events. current events. It's, it's unfortunate, but it's, it's something to know about because you know, it, it happens in family law. You have a 18 to 20 plus year uh, relationship with somebody. And unfortunately these life events happen and it's, it's, it's good to know that, um, there are some options out there, but on our website, we have information about grandparents' rights. I believe we have information about step-parent rights. We also have information about wills and trusts. If you need to have some estate planning done um, because you're facing divorce, so check out our website. We've got additional information there as well. Yeah. Sounds great. I think also we could probably um, go into maybe just some questions that we've got this week from, from either clients or potential clients or comments on blogs. Um, if you guys are okay, maybe we can answer some, some questions. So it benefits anybody that's listening out there. Sure. sure. Sounds good to Sounds me. Good. Cool. Um, well, in a recent blog, we talked about financial circumstances and we were talking about um, obtaining a credit history report to start the analysis of a marital estate or, or maybe any issues that, that could be looming out there debt wise. Um, and so we encouraged people in a podcast to obtain their credit history report. And we actually got a question this week. How do I obtain my credit history? How do I, how do I go about doing that? Or is there a particular place that I should go to, to do that? Tyler, do you have maybe any input on that? Yeah, just, um, Real quick, so you're um, you're allowed by law one free credit report per year. Um, there are th there are three bureaus who who are you know run your run the credit uh, checks and you know uh, obtain all the credit history for each individual. Um, there's not one better than any other one. It, they all do it their own separate way, but they're all generally the same. Um, the best way to get your free credit report, you know, once per year is at a website. They've made it easier. It's, you know, annualcreditreport.com. Uh, you can go on there. You can get uh, three. You can get a credit report from all three. Uh, and what the credit reports is just gives you your history of your credit. It will show you, um, you know, your credit cards that you have open, student loans, bank loans, you know, and it it provides a, a history of everything. And and we use that in the firm to help us, you know, in individuals' cases, right? To to determine assets and and, and debts and things like that. Uh, but yeah, the the easiest and whether it's the best way, you know, is, is up to each individual, but, um, annualcreditreport.com, you can go on there. You can, you know, you, uh, just go through the process of logging in. You can get it once a year. You are, um, you can get as many credit reports as you would like, uh, meaning you're entitled to one free per year, you know, per the government. Uh, after that, the, they can charge you. However, the credit bureaus, there's a maximum. They can only charge you $13.50 per report after the first one. So it's not, you know, insurmountable if you needed to get another one. It's, it's not that much. Um, but yeah, uh, 
There are other ways to obtain it, and that's more um, credit monitoring, like uh, Credit Karma is a very popular site. There's a bunch of sites out there, and I will say that uh, these days, everybody does credit monitoring, right? If you have a credit card, you probably have the opportunity to have that credit card monitor your credit for you. They don't provide you credit reports, you know, but, you know, but that involves signing up and I mean, if, if it's a credit card, you're already signed up essentially, but, um, but yeah, so annualcreditreport.com would be the best, fastest way, I think, to get a three bureau report that we'd be able to use as a starting point. Great, great starting point. Yeah, definitely. It's a, it's a lot easier than I even thought, um, but uh, definitely go to that website even if you're not starting your divorce at this time, um, it's a good way to just start planning and seeing if there's any surprises out there. Um, and it's good to know that information uh, for your divorce planning. Okay, so another question that we have got in the past is how once, once maybe I'm a client of the firm or once I start interacting with the firm, you know, how will we communicate with one another? Um, I think there's sometimes maybe concerns with, um, you know, privacy. There might just be questions about, you know, what's the easiest, most feasible way for us to communicate with one another. And so, Karen, I know you probably get a lot of communication questions. I I, I do, and I appreciate that. Um, I think um, just overall, the questions I get is, um, you know, can I, can I text your firm? Can I email your firm? Can I call your firm? And it's yes to all of the above. Um, we like to know as part of our intake process what you prefer. So we always do your primary form of communication that enables that, that clear, transparent kind of conversations we need to have for scheduling and also for um, uh, just communications with your documents and things that you need to, to send to the firm. We also use um, a Clio, which is kind of a separate kind of modular conversation we can definitely have. That's We get a lot of questions on that because it's not something unless you're in kind of a, the, the law realm that you're probably going to be familiar with, but it's functionality you will be. So that's kind of maybe a caveat to that. But um, yeah, tech, uh, texting our firm or emailing our firm is, is great. Uh, I'm in the office 9 to 12, um, Monday through Friday. So the phones um, will, will be available most most likely during that time. Uh, we do our best to answer calls, emails, and text messages within 24 hours. So um, unless there's, you know, anything um, outside of that, but that's been our standard operation procedure and it's been work, been successful for our clients, no complaints. Um, but again, some people do prefer the texting, but just keep in mind the same guidelines still apply, um, that 24 hour kind of turnaround. Um, Right. In terms it's of not response. instantaneous. Yeah. It's not like you would text a friend or we text, you know, we text our family, that kind of thing. So. Yeah. Yeah. No, those are all great points. And I think maybe just to quickly highlight, um, if you are even further concerned about privacy, perhaps set up a free Gmail account for the time being. And then we can always talk to you a little bit more about private communications. If you want to primarily use our program Clio, where you'll have a a portal with a password, and we can communicate through there. If you feel that your email has been compromised, or if it's on a family account, and you're worried that other people in your family will see communications, just let us know, and we will adjust and make sure that your communications are, are private. Yep. Sounds good. And I think the last thing, then we'll wrap up for the day, is a, a big question when people are really focusing on the value of an attorney, or just can I financially even go through the divorce process? And, and, and some of the top questions we get um, are, what's the difference between a flat fee rate and an hourly rate type of case? And so um, just to give you an introduction as to the differences, I would say if, if you are looking for a flat fee case and you're looking to work with our firm, um, one thing that you could do even before you contact our firm is go through mediation. There is a website called Mediation Council of Illinois um, that you can find qualified trained mediators that can help you with your parenting issues or your overall divorce issues. Then we can help you with ensuring that all of your court documents and settlement agreements are drafted. And if you come to our office after mediation or working with a financial divorce professional, 
we're working with a divorce um, mental health professional, we can discuss whether or not your case qualifies for a flat fee. If, however, um, you need additional services, you need additional guidance, you need more um, legal advice to guide you through all of the issues within your case, please know that that would be an hourly rate case. And um, we do accept a retainer. That's a, a fee that you pay at the beginning of a legal case. And then we use it as a credit system. We bill our services against that retainer amount. It goes into our trust account. We can't use it for any other purpose. It's just for your legal case. And um, you know, a retainer is not an estimate for the overall cost of your case. It is, I don't wanna say it's just a getting started fee, but it is a fee that allows us to do a lot on your case to move you forward. And in the event we need additional services, then we do ask for a retainer plenishment. So there's always a credit that we can bill against. And it also helps just with setting expectations about your, your case. Um, we will talk if the retainer is depleted, how many other things that you need in your case. And then we budget that way. We know um, what you can invest more in if needed, or do we need to change either our position on issues or do we have any compromises or are we able to settle on certain items so that you're not investing further in legal fees? So that's just a little kind of 101 on a flat fee case. Um, we do not bill against anything. It's just a flat fee where we're not charging you for any other communications or services. And then an hourly rate case, which we do accept a retainer. Yeah, Okay. makes nice. sense. All right, guys. Well, thank you for joining us for this complimentary gathering. Hopefully you learned some new information about our firm, about um, divorce issues. And if you have any other questions or you think of questions, please feel free to submit any questions through our contact form on our website at bertlaw.com. Give us a call. Um, if you have our email, send us an email and we'll cover further questions at our next gathering next Wednesday. Anybody have anything to add? No, no. All good. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thanks, guys. And have a good week. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody.